We've already said this a couple times in our course, but it bears repeating. The most important safety item in your vehicle is you. Welcome back to our course. I'm Rob Robison. In this segment, we're going to talk about the perceptual skills needed for driving. This is a fancy way of saying that we need to use all our senses when we're driving. But why? As long as we can basically see and hear, that's all we need, right? Well, maybe not so much. It's more about all our senses working together to provide us with a big picture of what's going on around us as we drive. What we'll do is look at each of our senses and the way we use them. And then toward the end of the segment, we'll put them all together to get the big picture I talked about. So let's start out by talking about what we can see. Your eyesight is the single most important of your senses when driving. When keeping up your driver's license, certain exceptions can be made for all the different types of sensory impairment, but those exceptions involving eyesight are the strictest. The reason for this is simple. Experts say that 90% of the information that a driver must process is visual. At the same time, recent studies show that one in five drivers suffer from some sort of vision problem that affects their ability to drive. There are studies that have shown that drivers with vision problems suffer a higher rate of crashes. Let's quickly look at a few terms you'll hear when talking about your vision. Useful field of view refers to the amount of visual information that can be processed in a brief glance using both eyes. It is directly related to our ability to process information quickly and accurately. It may seem obvious, but it takes less time to see and identify a single simple object than it does to divide your attention between two or more objects. For an easy example, think of this. Have you ever pulled into a large parking lot early in the morning where there were only one or two cars? Now compare that with pulling into a mall parking lot on the weekend before Christmas. Another example might be that we can easily identify and react to a stop sign at an empty intersection. But then, if a car is coming from the other direction and two pedestrians are crossing the street in front of you, it gets a lot more complicated and takes more concentration to pay attention to. Our ability to process information changes and slows over time, particularly for situations where the environment is very complex. Another term is depth perception. Depth perception is the ability to judge the distance of objects in relation to you, especially when those objects are moving directly toward or away from you. For example, Depth perception is important in judging the distance and the speed of approaching vehicles when merging or turning, or as we mentioned earlier, passing on a highway. Visual acuity is defined as sharpness of vision, measured by the ability to discern letters or numbers at a given distance according to a fixed standard. When your eye doctor or the employee at the driver's license office asks you to read the letters on a chart, they're testing your visual acuity. But the vision test at your local driver's license office is only for one kind of visual acuity, and that is the center of your eye, where your vision is the most clear. There is another kind of visual acuity, though, that some experts believe is just as important. It's called peripheral visual acuity, and it's how sharply your eye sees at the sides of your visual field. Peripheral vision is the ability to see and distinguish objects outside your immediate field of view. An example of this might be seeing an approaching vehicle from either side. This occurs naturally without you having to take your attention away from what is in front of you. But the ability to use depth perception and peripheral vision slowly weakens over time. This decline can make distances and speeds of vehicles approaching from the edge of your vision more difficult to judge, and objects coming from the sides of your field of vision could sneak up on you. Beyond that, there are two types of visual acuity. There is what is known as static visual acuity, which is the ability to see stationary objects clearly. And then there is dynamic visual acuity, which is the ability to see objects in motion clearly. 
While everyone's eyes age differently, many people can continue to see clearly as they get older. But there are generally more changes in the ability to see moving objects over time. There is also evidence that the lenses of your eyes begin to yellow and get less transparent with age, as well as your pupils growing smaller and becoming less able to dilate or expand in lower light conditions. This can make it quite a bit tougher when driving at dusk or dawn. One common problem as we continue to age is that of cataracts. A cataract is a condition where the lens of the eye becomes progressively cloudier, resulting in blurred vision. Having cataracts can make it tougher for you to see the road, street signs, other vehicles, and people walking on or near the roadway, because a cataract clouds the eye's lens. Cataracts can affect your vision in several ways. Objects may look blurry, and things are more difficult to see in bright light. Headlight glare is often more intense, and colors look faded, and your night vision will be worse. Double vision may also be present. When you have cataracts, you may also need to change your glasses or contact lenses more often. If you have any of these symptoms, check with an eye care expert. Even a small change in your vision can make a big difference in seeing at the long distances required by driving. If you have cataracts, you might be able to drive safely for many years if you have no other serious medical problems. But over time, cataracts will get worse and more of the lens of your eye will become clouded. Other vision problems for drivers can come in several different forms beyond simply aging though. Color vision deficiency, or color blindness, affects about 1 in 12 adult males and about 1 in 200 women. For the vast majority of people with deficient color vision, the condition is genetic and has been inherited from their mother, although some people become colorblind as a result of diseases, such as diabetes and multiple sclerosis. Or they acquire the condition over time due to the aging process, or perhaps from medication. If you're affected by color blindness, it could cause problems when identifying traffic signals or brake lights of other vehicles while driving. With cataracts, your ability to tell the difference between colors gradually decreases. Another issue affecting your vision is when you have contrast sensitivity problems. Poor contrast sensitivity is when you see objects that are not outlined clearly or that they do not stand out from their background. This can be a symptom of serious eye conditions. Examples of problems could include difficulty seeing pedestrians walking along poorly lit roads and road signs in fog or at night. Because vision is so critical to our world, people who begin to suffer from vision issues can often have more problems than just driving safely. Researchers have found that people suffering from bad vision had a 31% higher mortality risk during a recent eight-year study. Declines in vision have also been linked to depression. According to a 2013 study, adults suffering from degraded vision were 90% more likely to be depressed than those who had no vision problems. Researchers have found that more than 10% of people living with vision loss reported symptoms of major depression. A decline in vision can also cause an increase in anxiety. A study conducted in 2007 found that the decline of useful field of view raises the risk for anxiety in older drivers. The majority of people think that the main focusing lens of the eye is the cornea, but that isn't strictly true. The cornea's main function is to create a lens made out of your tear film. If you have dry eyes, you'll suffer from poor quality tear film and this will reduce the quality of your vision, especially at night. There are things that you can do to protect your vision though. First, consult an eye care professional. This is a good beginning point. They can use special charts and other equipment to identify any vision problems that you might have. You might need nothing more than glasses for driving, or you might be prescribed night driving glasses even if you don't wear glasses during the day. You can even ask your eye care professional for glasses with an anti-reflective coating that helps to reduce sun and headlight glare, giving you sharper driving vision. 
Contact lenses provide you with a natural and unobstructed view of the road, along with fewer distortions to enhance your seeing and driving ability. Another simple and permanent solution for improving your driving vision is LASIK eye surgery. If you're suffering from dry eye syndrome, get it treated immediately. Otherwise, it will get worse, and it will cause you to experience light scatter. You can also help yourself by making sure that you have clean headlights, windows, and mirrors before driving at night, and use your window defoggers in bad weather. As always, slow down, and when you can, turn on your high beam headlights in dark areas when there is no danger of interfering with other drivers' vision. If you're thinking of buying a new car and can afford it, look into a vehicle with built-in night vision system. Many of these systems use infrared cameras and other technology to detect people and animals and alert you to their presence by projecting an image onto the dashboard or windshield. As you can see, your eyesight is the cornerstone sense of the task of driving. Now let's look at the other senses also. As far as importance to the task of driving, your sense of vision is closely followed by that of your hearing. Your sense of hearing extends farthest away from you following your vision. You might think of your hearing as your second early warning system. About 15% of the population, aged 20 to 69, are affected by a diagnosable hearing loss. And of course, as age goes up, so does the number of people affected by hearing loss. Of course, hearing loss is also tied to your environment, both at home and at work. For the most part, there are three types of hearing loss. There is sensory neural hearing loss, conductive hearing loss, and mixed type hearing loss. Of the three, sensory neural hearing loss is the most common. A sensory neural hearing loss means that there is damage to either the tiny hair-like cells of the inner ear or to the auditory nerve itself. This damage prevents or weakens the carrying of nerve signals to the brain. These blocked nerve signals carry information about the loudness and clarity of sounds. A conductive hearing loss means that there is a problem with the mechanism that conducts sound from the environment to the inner ear. Problems in the outer ear, eardrum, or the bones of hearing are what cause a conductive loss. Conductive hearing loss can often be corrected by medication or surgery. And if not, the affected person usually does well with a hearing aid. Mixed hearing loss commonly occurs when the ear sustains some sort of trauma. It can also happen gradually over time when one's hearing loss is compounded by another. For example, an individual with long-standing conductive hearing loss might experience age-related hearing loss. When it comes to our hearing, like our eyesight, we're playing against the stacked deck. Many common illnesses can affect your hearing, as well as age and occupational risks. But your hearing can alert you to sounds like vehicle horns, emergency vehicle sirens, train whistles, and the engines and braking of vehicles around you. It also helps you with information about your own vehicle by giving you some warning of the mechanical problems that might cause unusual noises. Hearing loss can greatly impair your ability to hear important clues to driver safety. Street noise outside the car and the hum of traffic can make it difficult for normal hearing drivers to detect driving issues and for those with hearing loss, background noise presents an even greater challenge. Again, part of the problem, as far as driving goes, is that most people lose their high-frequency hearing quicker than low- or mid-range hearing. This means sounds like sirens and train whistles or backup alarms are some of the first to be affected. You must take care of your hearing, just like your eyes. Most of us understand that once your vision starts to get worse, it will continue to. But many people are surprised that this is even more true with your hearing. There are things that you can do to protect the hearing that you have, though. If you're going to be in a loud environment, wear hearing protection. If you're exposed to loud noises for a prolonged period of time, 
such as at a bar or a concert. Your ears have to have time to recover. Even when you're at an event, if you can step outside for five minutes to let your ears rest, it's helpful. Interestingly, researchers have also determined that your ears will need an average of 16 hours of quiet to recover from one loud night out. There's another way loud noises affect our driving too. There have been several studies that investigated the effects of music and noise on driving and other tasks. It was found that sometimes music can reduce driver stress and aggression and even facilitate performance. But there have also been a number of studies that have found that driving with too much music can impair driving performance. Volume, tempo, and the type of music can all have different effects. In one study, it was noted that with younger drivers, while their preferred music might help their positive mood, their driving habits get worse. This included a rise in the number of citations received, as well as more incidents of aggressive driving and distracted driving. Think about the list of things that we must listen for. Emergency vehicles. You most usually hear them before you see them. This helps by giving you more time to pull over and to get out of the way before you hinder their progress to what could be a life-threatening situation. Railroad crossings. When a train is approaching an intersection, they are required by federal law to sound their horn in a specific manner. Railroad crossing arms are usually equipped with a klaxon that makes a sound to add another distinct warning of the incoming train. Vehicle brakes. Brakes can make several different kinds of sounds, and if you know what to listen for, they can tell you things like whether a driver might be distracted and that they had to slam on their brakes to avoid a collision or they can tell you that a vehicle's brakes are not in good repair by their squealing or grinding, which is something to be cautious of also. Hearing these sounds should at least make you look around for their source and whether you need to address your driving for your and the other driver's safety. A screech of tires can even tell you of an impending crash in time for you to avoid becoming part of it or that there may be an animal in the roadway. This brings up an issue that has some serious misunderstanding about it. If an animal darts out in front of your car, should you swerve to avoid it? The answer is no, never. The reason is simple. While it may be sad or frustrating to hit a deer or coyote, you're hitting something that is not as big as you and not made of steel. But the main reason you never want to swerve to avoid an animal is because you risk losing control of your vehicle, especially at highway speeds. It's a fact that most animal versus car crashes happen on two-lane roads. If you swerve to avoid a dog, you're putting your vehicle off the road or into the wrong lane. When driving at night, scan your eyes onto the shoulder of the road. Many animals will stand and watch the road for a moment before they try to cross. If you're driving a sensible speed and you're paying attention, you might see them in time to slow down. That's what will really give them a better chance. As I said, the ability to hear is important to helping you stay safe on the road. If you use your hearing diligently, it will help you be a better driver. Now let's talk about your sense of touch for a moment. Your sense of touch may not seem like an obvious one, but if you let it, it can play a strong role in your ability to drive safely. Whether it's through your hands or your feet, or to use the old saying, in the seat of your pants, paying attention to your sense of touch can sometimes make all the difference. We all know that when you're taught to drive, you're taught to keep both hands on the wheel. Some say your hands should be at 10 and 2 on the wheel, but most experts now agree that 9 and 3 is best. But you should always drive with both hands on the wheel to give you maximum stability and control. It does something else though. It gives you a physical connection that can be useful in feeling different things happening in your vehicle, through your hands and the seat of your pants. 
What I mean when I say by the seat of your pants is that an involved driver will begin to use his entire body to feel what is happening with his vehicle and the way it's handling on the road. A very real example of this is when you go around a corner a little too fast and you feel the centrifugal force in your whole body. By driving with your body, you'll be able to feel mechanical issues that might develop in your vehicle, such as a poorly balanced tire, or perhaps a tire that's going flat. Another way that your sense of feel helps you is in knowing your vehicle well enough that you do not have to constantly take your eyes off the road in order to find a button or a control. The sensation of touch in the car is important for operating your vehicle safely. Another kind of touch or feel that helps in a vehicle is in your feet, and this applies to the use of your pedals. Through them, we know exactly how much throttle or how much brake pedal force is being applied. This is why it is important for all drivers to be able to feel the pedals properly, so adjustment of seat and pedals is important. Remember that heavy winter boots can desensitize a driver's feet and make telling which pedal and how much pedal effort is being applied almost impossible. Problems with the tires, like an air leak or an alignment problem, will pull your vehicle to one side or the other. You can feel these things as they happen. If you feel your engine running roughly, you might have time to pull over and check it out before you break down in traffic. If you're paying attention to your sense of touch and feeling, you'll have a better connection with your vehicle and with the road as well. Finally, let's talk about our sense of smell. This could be another one of our senses where some might ask how the ability to smell would aid in the task of driving, but it can. Have you ever been going down a hill behind a semi-truck and noticed a foul chemical smell around you? It's usually the brakes of the truck in front of you as they are heating up from the driver trying to slow the rig. What it should be telling you and the driver is that the brakes are being pushed hard, maybe too hard. As brakes heat up, their ability to slow a vehicle becomes diminished and their failure becomes more likely. Your nose just told you that you might not want to be in front of the truck when the brake goes out completely. Your sense of smell can also tell you things about your own vehicle, such as when it's overheating or if it has an oil or a fuel leak. As we end this section on perceptual skills in driving, there are two senses we haven't talked about. The sense of taste probably shouldn't be used when driving. In fact, if you're using the sense of taste, it, you might want to stay parked at the fast food place. It's safer. Finally, let's talk about the other sense, and that isn't really a sense at all. It's common sense. In regular daily driving, our brains are processing hundreds or thousands of pieces of information all at once. If we fail to pay attention to one or the other of our senses, it can seriously delay the skills necessary for a specific driving action. When a driving emergency occurs, you must recognize a hazard, assess that hazard, and react to it all in a split second. In this segment, I talked about each of the senses individually and described how they're used, but common sense tells us that we have to use all of these senses together with each other in order to give us a much clearer picture of the driving task and how to perform it better and safer.